Up until junior year of high school, I flew mostly under the social radar and stuck to my status as a nerd girl, but when I was 15, I joined Varsity Cheer. My school's cheerleaders weren't popular by definition, but everyone kind of knew who we were because we were on the announcements, performed at pep rallies, and generally engaged with the students a lot. I made a lot of friends that year, and some of them happened to be the cool kids. For a while, I thought this was my long-awaited karma payoff for the years of bullying I'd suffered at their hands. I even developed a crush on one of them, a crush which the junior cheer captain herself volunteered to help me pursue. Homecoming is a big deal where I'm from, and I began to fantasize about my crush asking me to go with him. I'd heard rumors he was planning a dramatic proposal, and as homecoming season approached, I became more and more sure I would be his date. The junior cheer captain, who was close with him, kept dropping hints that I was right. One day at practice, she asked me what my favorite candy was, and I knew it would be so my crush would know what to give me. You can imagine my surprise when, after an exhausting theater rehearsal, I walked into the parking lot and was confronted by a guy I'd hardly spoken to asking me to be his date. My theater friends all applauded, assuming I was overjoyed. I saw both my parents in the parking lot recording the whole surprise. But most importantly, the cool kids I'd recently befriended were standing right there behind him, egging him on. I didn't understand why, because he wasn't popular at all. In fact, he was known to be kind of creepy. The junior cheer captain was laughing, encouraging him to give me the box of my favorite candy he was holding. She definitely orchestrated the whole thing. I didn't really know the guy, but I didn't want to humiliate him in front of the coolest kids in school, so I faked a smile and rolled with it. I promised myself I'd deny him later, in private, so he wouldn't be embarrassed. Afterwards, when my parents excitedly asked me how I felt about the ordeal, I explained how uncomfortable it made me. I said that I got strong creepy vibes from the guy. That didn't fly with my parents. My mother accused me of having expectations too high, and my father demanded to know if I was secretly a lesbian. I had never had a boyfriend or shown much interest in dating. To make his case stronger, I'd just become best friends with the only openly gay girl our school had ever seen. Long story short, I knew that if I shut down my date, I'd effectively declare war on my parents. However, I played my dad's protective instinct against him and persuaded him to let me friendzone my date. After all, he knows how high school boys think, right? I texted my date that night and explained that I only saw us as friends, but would still be happy to go to homecoming with him. He was very polite about it, although I could tell he was interested in me romantically. It seemed we'd reached a deal until the next day at school, when one of my cheerleader friends referred to my date as my boyfriend. I corrected her and told her we're just going to homecoming as friends. She seemed confused and told me my date was telling anyone who could listen that I was his girlfriend. A few more of my friends approached me with similar comments, and I confronted my date about them. He denied all involvement and suggested it was just a rumor. I reminded him that we were just friends and I had zero romantic interest in him. He said he understood. I got a call from the junior cheer captain. She pretended to be sweet and conspiratorial, but I was still annoyed that she'd led me to believe my crush would ask me to homecoming. She began her attempt to persuade me that I was wrong to friends on my date. She said that she'd spent many afternoons planning his proposal with him, and she knew he was kind of creepy from afar, but he was sweet and caring underneath all that. I said, if he was such a catch, she should date him. Annoyed, she dropped the sweet act. She told me that I had to date him, because he liked me so much and he'd gone to so much trouble to ask me to homecoming. I had to give him a chance, because he'd gone out on a limb for me. I told her she was wrong, and I didn't have to do anything I didn't want to do, and I owed him nothing. I ended up hanging up on her soon after that, but that was just the beginning. Starting the next Monday, he would corner me in the hallway and give me a rose he held in his teeth. He usually did so between my 6th and 7th periods, when my path through the hall crossed his. I was deeply uncomfortable with this and told him so, but he wouldn't stop. I took different routes to escape him, but the junior cheer captain and her posse made a point of tracking me down so he could find me elsewhere. Every time he did this, everyone in the area would treat it as a sweet romantic gesture, despite my obvious discomfort. 
Wouldn't any girl be lucky to have a boy so devoted to her that he gave her a rose every day? He was still telling everyone I was his girlfriend. The final straw, for me, was when he walked into a class he wasn't in to find me and give me my daily rose. My teacher, who was friends with the junior cheer captain, let this happen. For weeks afterwards, she would ask me about my date every day. When he came in, I told him to get out and leave me alone. His feelings were clearly hurt, and he left looking like a kicked puppy. My classmates started calling me a cold hard b-word. It didn't matter what I had to say about him I was an ice queen, refusing this sweet boy's advances. Everyone in the school had decided that I was in love with him, and nobody cared what I had to say about it. My crush, who was part of the popular group, joined the junior cheer captain in pressuring me into returning my date's feelings. At every event where the cheerleaders were present, my date would push his way to the front of the crowd. He would go to great lengths to get my attention. At football games, he would wave a flag in the student section so I'd look at him when we were cheering. The other girls would make comments on how endearing he was when he waited in the parking lot by our bus back to the school just to hug me and tell me how great I did. I didn't know what else to do other than let this happen. I had only recently ascended to a position of visibility. If I conflicted too hard with the cool kids who were so dead set on setting me up with this guy, I could be an outsider all over again. I hoped that if I just kept ranting to my real friends about how creepy he was and publicly let him do what he wanted, it would all blow over. My school had a 15 second attention span, so some scandal had to one-up me sooner or later. The truth emerged, as usual, in the locker room. It turns out the junior cheer captain had been telling him, during their afternoons together, that I was into him. He'd come to her for help announcing his crush on me, and she'd gone a step further and convinced him I felt the same, despite the fact that I didn't even know his name. She'd lied to him for weeks prior to the homecoming proposal, and when I told her that was wrong, she didn't care. She told me I should be grateful, because everybody was starting to think that I was gay. My best friend, the lesbian who was starting a gay revolution, and I, inspired, spread a rumor that we were dating. After all, everybody already thought I was gay, right? But my date wasn't phased. In fact, he told everyone that he'd just turned me straight again. Three weeks after he asked me, it was finally homecoming night. Thanks to cheer obligations and a complete coincidence involving a switched backpack that left me without my dress, I ended up only attending the dance for half an hour. My date awkwardly stood on the side of the room while I danced my heart out to Mr. Brightside. I almost felt bad for him when, right at the end, the junior cheer captain appeared like a summoned demon to suggest we slow dance at the next opportunity. Thank God I escaped that one by walking to the DJ and suggesting he play Footloose. My date walked me out to the parking lot to wait for my mom to pick me up. While we waited for her to drive around, which took entirely too long because she still hoped I'd stop making a fuss and date him, he asked me out. I politely declined. He quickly stammered that we could go with a group of people, like the junior cheer captain and my crush. I denied him again and made it clear we were only friends, and I wasn't interested in romantic endeavors because I was too busy. That was actually true, I was in all advanced classes, varsity theater and cheer, and worked part-time. A few days later, a teacher eloped to Vegas, and nobody cared about my love life anymore. My date and I were distanced again by classes and activities and work. It appeared that everything was going back to normal. That Friday at the football game, my crush asked me to sit on his shoulders for the alma mater. Overjoyed, I accepted, and I hoped this was the beginning of a new chapter for me. I ignored the frantically waving flag in the stands. Monday, my date stood on a chair in his second period class and announced that everyone should be wary of my crush because he would steal your girl. I heard everyone buzzing about it a few hours later when someone called me the B-word again for breaking my date's heart. I knew I was being dramatic, but I decided not to go to lunch that day, terrified of running into him. I'm so glad I didn't. Later, I saw on Snapchat that my date had carved my name into his arm with a pair of scissors. His bleeding arm was screenshotted and sent to me by half a dozen people, most of them demanding why I'd hurt him like this.
He did it in the middle of lunch in a crowded cafeteria, and somehow, no administration noticed or cared. The school was buzzing. My date was a broken-hearted victim, and I was the evil, secretly gay girl who wouldn't give him a chance. I got so many dirty looks. By fifth period, I was ready to just walk out, but my good girl instincts kicked in and I decided to tough it out for two more hours. Around that time, I got a panic text from one of my cheer friends. While she'd initially been insistent that I date the creepy guy, she'd apparently changed her mind after the lunch incident earlier. She told me that my date, who was in her fifth period class, was going off the rails. He had started out saying that he wanted to kill himself because I wouldn't love him. This had escalated to saying he'd kill my crush for lying to me and stealing me away. Finally, he'd started talking about how he knew where I lived because my parents had given him my address when he initially wanted to ask me to the dance at my house and he would make me pay for wronging him. I knew that, after sixth period, our paths through the hall would cross. Since the beginning of this ordeal, the school had cracked down on students getting outside and my alternate route to escape him was no longer an option. My class was at the far end of the hall with nowhere to go but into the central hub, and he would be coming from the other end of the hallway towards mine. I was stuck up a chimney, basically. Desperate, I texted the junior cheer captain to finish what she started and tell him that I was not and had never been interested in him. She'd made this mess, and I would make sure she had to clean it up. She said she'd go to the counselor, but she didn't know what else to do. This was way beyond her control now. For the first and only time, I skipped class. I hid out in the theater hall and waited for the seventh period. I got a few texts during the passing period that my date was waiting for me by the bathrooms. There was a little alcove right there where you can't see people coming around the corner, and the thought of him hiding there and waiting for me to walk by alone horrified me. Right before seventh period began, a few of my classmates burst in, cackling, and proclaimed that my date was coming down here after school to kill my crush. They thought this was hilarious, but judging by the look on my crush's face, this wasn't a joke to him anymore. Our teacher brushed this off as typical theater drama pun fully intended. I watched the clock and tried not to cry, knowing that by the time the bell rang my date would be outside, waiting for me and my crush to emerge. That day ended up being a work day, so my crush and I were able to escape the classroom and hide out elsewhere in the theater hall to get away from him. He opted for the black box theater, and I went for the lighting closet. Obviously, I didn't witness what happened, but my best friend filled me in afterwards. Allegedly, my date had turned up three minutes before the bell rang and stood outside the classroom where we couldn't see him when we opened the door. He told everyone standing around that he was ready to have a knife fight with my crush. We don't know if he actually had a knife or not, but the idea that he might was enough to terrify me. His arm was wrapped in paper towels that he was bleeding through. My best friend told him my crush and I were gone, but he didn't believe her. He stood outside for 25 minutes until the administrators began walking through to make sure no one was in the school who shouldn't be. My date wasn't in the theater, so he wasn't allowed to stick around. That night, I texted him that not only would I never date him, but could no longer even see a friendship between us. I sent him a number to a suicide hotline and told him to get help. Finally, I told him that he needed to learn what no meant and I never wanted to speak to him again. He responded that he was sorry and asked if there was anything he could do to fix this. I told him no. I don't think he learned the meaning of the word after all, because the same pattern repeated itself a few months later on Valentine's Day, the next year at homecoming, senior year Valentine's Day, and prom, but those are other stories. My stalker reappeared on Valentine's Day 2016. I was still a junior, but I had almost forgotten that homecoming even happened when, halfway through my day, he cornered me in the hallway and gave me a rose out of his teeth. I hoped that would be the end of it but I underestimated my classmates' appetite for drama. During 7th period theater, we were in the library computer lab. After the Rose thing, my crush from fall semester, who had since come out as gay, warned us that my stalker was carrying around a present for me in his backpack. I thanked him for the heads up and told my best friend. She and I were sitting together on the inside of a row when the bell rang. 
We stood up to leave, but the girl on the other side of me turned to face us, blocking us off from the exit. She was a close friend of the junior cheer captains. She asked me what I was doing after school, and I knew that she must be trying to herd me towards my stalker so I could collect my presents. I leveled with her and said I knew my stalker was waiting for me somewhere, and I told her straight up that I wasn't going to play nice with him anymore. She turned on the same old guilt trip as everyone else, telling me how much he cared about me and how hard he worked on these prisons, but I refused to go. I knew I needed to get out of the school as soon as possible, before she just told my stalker to come meet me at the library instead of the theater hall. To get her out of my way, I said I'd go meet him after I went to the bathroom, and she moved out of the walkway. My best friend and I hid out in the bathroom farthest from the theater hall. I knew he wouldn't leave until he'd delivered his gifts, and we had rehearsal that day, so I knew I'd have to go down there sooner or later. My best friend suggested she go down and retrieve the presents for me, so he'd leave before I had to go to rehearsal. Two more of my friends happened upon our bathroom crisis, and they decided to link up with my best friend on her mission. I waited in the bathroom while they went to intercept the gifts. Twenty minutes later, they returned. Among the gifts were three boxes of my favorite candy, which I didn't really like anymore, thanks to this whole mess, an expensive Doctor Who jewelry box, and a full bouquet of roses, again. They told me, laughing uncomfortably, that there had been a whole group of people waiting for me to walk into the theater hall. My stalker wasn't too happy to hand over the presents, but my best friend made it clear I wouldn't be coming to get them, so he could hand them over to my friends or never deliver them at all. After about 10 minutes, the group waiting for me dissipated, and my stalker gave away the gifts. I was so creeped out that I didn't keep any of them, not even the jewelry box, which was TARDIS-shaped and actually kind of cool. For my birthday a few weeks later, I got out of school after fourth period and went to a theme park with my cousin. I didn't tell anyone I was leaving or where I was going. My best friend told me my stalker had waited outside the theater hall for me with a letter and a rose in hand until the school kicked everyone out who wasn't in the theater. I was assistant director and light crew for one act play that spring. An acquaintance of mine who didn't keep up with gossip was in charge of making the program, and she mentioned how cute my boyfriend was for taking out an ad in the program for me. I was sufficiently freaked out, told her I didn't have a boyfriend, and asked to see the ad he'd paid for. It was a picture of my stalker and I from junior homecoming, along with a note that said something like, Good luck, saucy, I love you. I begged my friend not to put it in the program, and she didn't, seeing my obvious discomfort. She refunded him his money and made some excuse about a local business buying more at space. He tried the same trick for the last show of the year, which I was actually in. He showed up to opening night and got kicked out for filming. The theater department has now instituted a widespread rule of checking with the person an ad is targeted at before printing it, which is more than school administration ever cared to do. During a cleanup day for theater the summer before senior year, a guy from a different school showed up to help. He had been talking to me over social media for a few weeks, and I knew I was his next target. He'd made a game out of going on a date with every girl in our department. Sure enough, he asked me out while I cleaned up the prop closet, and I agreed. He was decent looking, and he wasn't mentally unstable, even if he was a fuckboy. I also knew that, if I played my cards right, I could turn this to my advantage. He was using me, so I just made sure I got something out of it, too. We went on our date, it was okay, no weird advances or anything, and he bought me dinner. On the way home, I directed the conversation towards homecoming. He caught my drift and asked me right there, no muss, no fuss. I said yes. Senior year started. My new boyfriend was all the way over at his school on the other side of town. My stalker was in two of my classes, fourth period biology, sixth period English, and had the same lunch as me. I was hyper aware of him staring at me every day, but didn't want to make a big deal about it. I knew he wanted my attention, and I refused to give it to him. Instead, I went about my life as usual. I made friends with the teachers who were lunch hall monitors so I could leave the cafeteria, effectively avoiding my stalker. I ate lunch in the theater hall with my best friend every day. 
I asked my biology and English teachers not to make me sit by him or work in groups with him, and they agreed, if somewhat reluctantly. They, like pretty much everyone else, thought I was a dramatic cheerleader making up stories. I was a senior, and I really didn't want to deal with the bullcrap of a crazy stalker anymore, not that I ever wanted to in the first place. Homecoming was even earlier this year than last year. In English class, my stalker sat near two theater girls who usually walked to 7th period theater with me, and he turned around to ask them for ideas on how to ask me to homecoming. They were in the camp of classmates who were amused by my stalker's antics, so they wanted to rile him up and watch the fireworks. They also knew about the fuckboy I was talking to, because theater kids are the worst gossips ever, and they gleefully told my stalker that I already had a date. He proceeded to attempt to bite his finger off in class, which went about as well as you might think. Obviously, he didn't succeed, but he did draw blood, and he terrified my two theater friends who had incited his instability. He stared at me the whole time, and I sat on the other side of the room and ignored him. I didn't care what he did, I refused to give him my attention, and I wouldn't be intimidated by him anymore. After class, my two friends came up to me and told me the details of what had just happened. Together, the three of us approached the English teacher. She believed me fully this time. He was moved into a different English class by the next week. Side note, bless this teacher. She was the first adult I encountered who took action to protect me, and she continued to check in with me about the situation throughout the rest of senior year. Sixth period became nothing less than a sanctuary for me, because, for once, somebody believed me, and they were listening. I didn't have to worry about him after fourth period, because I skipped lunch every day. I was getting confident about my escape maneuvers. Then my usual hall monitor was gone, and I got stuck in the cafeteria. I had been out of lunch for so long that I had forgotten my stalker was in the same one until I accidentally made eye contact with him, staring at me from across the room like some kind of grudge ghost. The second I saw him, he started speed walking across the room to my table. I ignored him, hoping he was just trying to psych me out, but it didn't work. He sat down in the seat next to mine. I was freaking out. I looked at the girl on the other side of me and begged her to get him out of here. She simply laughed at me. A year before, I would have kept quiet and dealt with my discomfort for fear of people hating me, but I was a year older and already contracting senioritis, so I stood up, grabbed my backpack, and stomped out of the lunchroom. The hall monitor stopped me, asking where I was going and if I had a pass. I said I was going to talk to the crisis counselor, and he let me go, probably because he didn't want to touch that with a ten-foot pole. I walked directly to the counselor's office, signed in, and found myself sitting in her office a few minutes later. I told her the whole story from the beginning. I had been to her office once before, and she'd shooed me away after saying I was being too dramatic. This time, she didn't. Instead, she spent the greater half of the hour I was there asking why I hadn't come to her when all this started. When I finally got her to address the actual problem, her first question reaffirmed my fears. She asked me, after I told her about the self-harm and threats and general creepery, what about him made me so opposed to dating him. I thought I was going to scream. I had a gut feeling that the truth wouldn't get me anywhere, and I needed action. I didn't care how I got it done, but I needed him out of my life and definitely out of my classes. So, knowing full well her attachment to Jesus, I pulled the Saving Myself for Jesus card. I put all those Sundays being forced to go to church to good use, and it worked. She stopped asking me why I'd waited, why not just date him, and asked what would make me feel safer. I told her to get him out of my schedule, and she said she'd look into my options. Within a few days, I was called back to her office. She had gotten him placed in another lunch period, but biology was only offered in the fourth period, and both of us needed it to graduate. I still considered this a victory. I only had to see him for 50 minutes every day. She told me to come talk to her whenever I needed someone to lean on. She would make sure my teachers understood. Fun fact, junior year, my best friend was sexually assaulted by an adult man. When she left class, mid-panic attack, to go see this crisis counselor, she was told to pull herself together and get back to class before she missed anything important. 
My stalker found new methods of seeing me. My best friends didn't make the cast of the Winter Musical, but I did. I didn't realize that I had been isolated until my stalker joined the crew and regularly tried to intimidate me. He would drill holes and set pieces that didn't need work because I was sitting near them and he wanted to watch me flinch. He would steal the props I used and hide them in the shop so I had to be near him to retrieve them. My new crush and I were co-dance captains, and she convinced her friend the set head to keep my stalker off stage at all times. After the musical ended in spring, my new crush told me she'd heard my stalker was getting angry about me playing hard to get. I was hanging out in the theater hall with a few crew kids, getting ready for one act play, when one of them pointed at me, shocked, and went, you're saucy. He told me he'd seen pictures of my backyard. I was confused and weirded out, so he explained that my stalker had shown him pictures of my backyard and porch. I asked to see them, and he said he didn't have the pictures, he'd just been shown them by my stalker. I didn't really believe him, and he could tell, so he said, you have a big bay window in your living room, a bunch of bikes on your back porch, and a big ass rosebush. It was an accurate description. I don't know for sure how to explain that, but I theorized that my stalker had, at some point, been in my backyard before we adopted our purebred Doberman. The dog had freaked out in the middle of the night a few times, but we brushed it off. Now, I wasn't so sure. My bedroom was in the front of the house, so I tried to reassure myself by thinking he hadn't seen me changing or anything super scary, but it didn't really help. My best friend was disowned by her mother and stepdad, and within a weekend she was shipped off to live with her biological father. I told myself I could survive the next four months and graduate, and then I'd never see my stalker again. I persuaded my parents, as prom and graduation approached, that I only wanted one present, my best friend. They paid for her plane ticket both ways and flew her home to be my date to prom. I kept her a secret so I could surprise our other friends when she showed up at prom to dance with us. My stalker only briefly entertained the thought of asking me to prom, which I later discovered was the, now senior, cheer captain's doing. I guess she'd finally started to realize the full effect of her actions because she would told him he needed to leave me alone. I don't know what else she said, but he went eerily silent in the weeks leading up to prom. He still came to the last play of the year, but he didn't film me this time. He waited for me outside the auditorium afterwards, but I was with other people on our way to the cast dinner, and he didn't try anything. At prom, my friends were elated when they saw my best friend had returned. We danced and talked crap and had a great time together. It was honestly one of the best moments of my life when they walked in and saw her. Of course, my stalker tried one last time to change my mind. My friends and I were sitting at one of the tables together, laughing and catching up, and I saw my best friend's expression turn into a glare when someone walked up behind me. I turned around to see my stalker, waiting behind my chair. I stood up and said, as calmly as possible, that he wasn't welcome here. I was also 17 and pissed off and feeling unstoppable, so I tacked on, if you ever speak to me again, I'll rip your private parts off. It was the last thing I ever said to him. My best friend flew away again, we all graduated, and everyone went our separate ways for college. I saw my stalker again at the first homecoming after I graduated high school, but he didn't talk to me. He just stared at me the whole game. Later, he showed up to my sister's fall play at our alma mater, and he asked a cast member where she was and if I was there. Lucky me, the cast member was one of my littles, and he told my stalker he needed to leave immediately. Honestly, I never hear anyone talk about it seriously, but living in small towns seems to make people cruel. Maybe it is just the sheer boredom that brings out the worst in people? Anyways, this is my first time retelling this story, so please bear with me. I grew up in a rural Texas town with a crippling meth problem, no positive outlets for people to do activities like a movie theater or a park, and we didn't even have a large grocery store to just hang out in. The teens mostly just ended up drinking, driving, and going to bonfires, but quite a few of the teenage boys in my neighborhood decided that being evil was the best way to have fun. They would literally go out of their way while driving to swerve and try to scare younger kids riding bikes, 
poison loose dogs, and even set fire to a few of the trailers in my neighborhood while people were still in them. Only one arrest was ever made in connection to the arson, but it had definitely been a group activity. My neighborhood was a trailer park in which each trailer was placed on a few acres of land with at least some forested area between each plot of property. The road was an older dirt road with gravel and rocks poured over the dirt, which is what I had to learn to ride a bike on. It was difficult. One day around 10 or 15 years ago, I was doing my best to ride the bike on this rock road without falling. While riding away from my house, I saw my older sister who was about 16 at the time sprinting alongside the road towards me from the opposite direction. I was going very slow trying to keep my balance but decided to just get off the bike when I noticed how panicked my sister looked. I saw a dust cloud coming from the road but a fairly large hill was blocking the view of my sister and I from any vehicles that were coming towards us. When my sister got to me she grabbed my arm so hard that I winced in pain and she pulled me away from the bike. By this time the truck that was producing the dust trail was just coming over the hill but was still fairly far away so I don't think they noticed us. There are woods around 10 feet off both sides of the road where I was and my sister was pulling me into the woods on the left side of the road. I complied but was asking her what was happening. She just told me to hurry. We made it about 30 feet into the woods when my sister dropped to the ground and pulled me with her. She covered my mouth and told me to be quiet. I complied. I saw that the vehicle she was worried about was a black truck filled with five guys that were in their late teens or very early twenties. The truck screeched to a stop right where my bike was. I froze solid when I heard my sister whisper crap. Three of the guys got out of the car, but didn't say anything. It was clear that they were looking very intensely into the woods on both sides of the road. Luckily, for some reason I am not sure of, they all lined up and started approaching and walking into the woods on the opposite side of the road. They were talking, but we couldn't make out what they were saying. I was worried that they would take their time looking for us since only a handful of people lived this far down the road and it could have taken hours before another car would pass through. It took about five minutes of perfect stillness and silence before one did, though. One of the guys had already placed my bike in the back of the truck when they noticed another car coming over the hill behind them. They quickly jumped in the truck and sped off. We waited there for probably 10 more minutes before we stood up and started the walk back home, although we walked right along the tree line instead of on the road itself, just in case. My sister didn't say much to me, but told my mom when we got home that one of the boys that she had been hanging out with was talking about wanting to kill some of the annoying kids in the neighborhood. She assumed that it was a good bet that one of those annoying kids might end up being one of her three younger siblings. It could have been any of us, but I was the one that wanted to go ride my bike alone that day instead of playing video games with my two brothers. She decided to head home when none of the other guys seemed to go against the guy talking about wanting to kill kids, or even jokingly escalate his desire to kill annoying kids with more details. She had been running home and got just enough of a head start before the boys hopped in their truck to stop whatever they might have done. The cops were informed, but apparently the boys disagreed and a parent claimed they never left the trailer, so nothing ever came of it. I knew two of the boys' names because we lived in the same neighborhood in a small town, and I know they never got less evil. They later invited my sister to a bonfire party that everyone was going to be at, but my sister decided not to go. When she asked all of her friends how the party was, literally no one knew about it. That is because she was the only one invited. She stayed away from them ever since, and fortunately neither of us still live there. Of the two that I knew, one is currently incarcerated for several drug-related offenses, but the other is still out there. As for the other three that were in the truck, I have no idea where they are or what they are up to. So to the garbage boys in the truck, you can keep my bike because I hope we never meet again. This happened to me when I was a young boy. I am now in my late 50s and I haven't thought about being 10 years old in a long time. My youngest kid told me about this YouTube channel a while back so I thought you all might like to hear this story of someone I would never want to meet again. I remember it being around my 10th birthday when everything changed in my life for my family. 
I remember it being the best birthday yet because my mom had secretly saved up enough money to buy me my own bicycle, and I was more than thrilled. No more borrowing my older brother's, standing on the back of his, or sitting on the handlebars of a friend's bike. We were by no means well off when I was young. We didn't have much so getting that bike had meant a lot to me. My father was a man who worked a lot and drank even more than he worked. I am pretty sure he was drunk more than he was ever sober, and because of that, he was hardly around. That was okay with me, my siblings, and my mother for the most part. Things were actually nice and peaceful when he was not home. And the nights he did actually come home, we knew right away to steer clear of him, be quiet and leave him alone. We lived outside of a small town, down a long dirt road with not very many neighbors nearby. The closest house was a good mile down from us, a really big farmhouse with a lot of fields around them. I remember being friends with their kids as they were around the same age as us and we went to school together. Their mom was very sweet and always offered us something to eat or drink when we would stop down there. And their dad, well, he was the complete opposite of our father. I never saw him drink, yell, slap them, or their mom around. We knew that not every family was like ours and that some fathers out there actually seemed to care for them. Like I said, I remember it being around my 10th birthday because my mom had baked a big cake for myself, my brother, and my two younger sisters to share and of course she had some too. Then she took me out back where she had hidden the bike from me in one of the sheds and I remember screaming with excitement, hugging, kissing her, telling her I loved her, and that she was the greatest mom ever. I hopped on the bike right away and took off up and down the road to test it out. It was a great feeling at that moment. When something so great happens, you kind of forget the regular hell life you seem to live every other day. It's hard to explain, I guess. Things were good the next couple of days. My father had not been really home for almost a week probably at that point. Sometimes he would just stop in for a few moments here or there, I guess to just check up to make sure my mom hadn't left him or anything. When I was that age, I hardly recall at any point in time when he was home for more than one or two nights in a week and never two nights in a row. We, the kids, never knew what he was doing nor did we ever really want to know, we just knew it was better at home when he wasn't there. I remember riding my bike down the dirt road on my way home from running into town to pick up something at the grocery store for my mom. When my dad's pickup truck passed me and kept heading on down toward home. It made me want to not even go back home, but really, what else could I do? The sun was just starting to go down and normally if he did come home, it was right after work or very late at night after he left who knows where. So it was kind of odd he was on his way home at this time of the day. By the time I pulled up into the yard, I could already hear the yelling. I could hear my mom's voice, trying to reason with him for something or other, and then I would hear my dad's voice just overpower hers. I heard something smash. I didn't want to go inside. I could hear my little sisters bawling, and then I heard my mom crying too. My older brother just happened to be down at the neighbor's place that had the farmhouse. I really didn't want to go inside at this point. I heard another smash. I decided to go in because I couldn't leave my mom and sisters in there alone with him. I peeked in the window of the door before I actually walked in and saw the house getting destroyed right in front of my family by my crazy, drunk father. I tried opening the door slightly and getting my sister's attention to come out but my dad saw and went from focusing on them to me. I blocked a lot of this out but from what I can remember, he turned and went straight for me and picked me up by my shoulders and started screaming in my face. My mom was behind him, begging him to put me down, but he just turned and gave her another slap in the face, and she backed down. From what I could tell that was coming out of him, he was livid when he saw me riding down the road on a bike he knew wasn't my brother's. When he got home, he confronted my mom on where it came from and how I was on it. She told him that she had secretly been stashing away money to save up to get me the bike and my dad lost it when she told him that. I'm sure he was probably on a five or six day heavy drinking binge at this point because I remember the smell of his breath was like sour whiskey pouring into my nostrils as he screamed at me. He was sure that my mother was hiding other things from him and he was going to find out what. That is why he started tearing up the house. 
In the five minutes it took from him passing me on the road until I got there, he had done quite a bit. All the furniture was thrown around, lamps, and pictures had been smashed. He threw me against one of the walls, and as I looked up from the floor, he stormed into the kitchen and smashed what was left of my birthday cake against the back door. Both my sisters were huddled in the corner holding each other while my mom cried and had blood running down her face. That was it for me. This was the worst I had ever seen my father and I was scared. I ran out of the house, hopped on my bike, and started heading towards the neighbors. We did not have a telephone at that time, but I knew they did and I was going to call the police in town and stop him. I hardly got out of the driveway when I heard the front door open and heard my father yelling to me to get my ass back there. I just kept on peddling, thinking that I needed to get to the neighbors and everything would be better. That's when I heard his truck start up and I looked behind me as he was backing out of the driveway and started heading towards me. I could see the neighbor's house in the distance and just kept on peddling until I started to see the headlights getting closer and closer. I looked behind me and he was so close that I knew he was going to hit me. I remember just jumping off the bike towards the side of the road and tumbling down into the side of the field. I shot up and just started running across the field towards the neighbors, hearing my dad yelling but not really caring. When I looked behind me, I saw that my father had already turned around and was heading back towards our house. I got to the neighbors a few minutes later and pounded on the door. Their mom opened the door and took a step back because at this point I was sobbing, shaking, and probably didn't look like my normal self. She took me inside and called her husband to get in there. I was in the middle of telling them what happened when my brother and his friend walked in from playing out back, and in about two seconds he was out the door heading towards home. The mom called the police in town and they said they would send someone out right away. About ten minutes had passed and no police had shown up so I begged the husband to please drive me down to my house. I didn't know what was happening and I was scared. He agreed since he knew my little sisters and mom were there. About halfway down the road, we passed my bike. It was completely mangled up. My dad had run it over with his truck. I started crying again, partly because I loved that bike and mostly because I could have still been on it when he did that. We get to the house and my father's truck is gone. Apparently, my brother ran all the way home, picked up a baseball bat that was on the side of the house and with no hesitation, walked into the living room and smashed my dad's kneecap in. As he laid there screaming, my brother grabbed my sisters and mother and ran into one of the bedrooms. He managed to crawl out to his truck and drive away though. The cops showed up just a few minutes after the neighbor and I arrived, they took a look at everything that had happened. They found my father about an hour later, one town over at the local tavern. They said it wasn't very hard to find him since he was a well-known drunk in the area and the bars were the first places they were going to look for him. They arrested him pretty much on the spot. That night after the police found my father, the neighbors invited us to stay with them for however long we needed to. My mom was embarrassed but so very thankful for their help. We only stayed a couple of days, enough time for my mom to make arrangements to leave that town and go live with her sister for a while and a couple 100 miles away from where we lived. I never did see my father again after that and I have never really minded that. I know he wasn't in jail too long because shortly after we got settled in at my aunt's house, the phone calls and letters started. But my mom never caved and went back, but who would? After a year or so, he gave up and agreed to a divorce. I never really paid much attention to that as I was still young and was living a different life than I had before. We stayed with my aunt for a couple of years until my mom saved up enough money after getting a job to get our own place. At that point my brother was 16 or 17, so he also was helping bring in money from his job, as well as myself with a newspaper route. I even saved up enough money to get myself another bike. Life was better than it ever had been. Thanks for letting me share. Basically, this happened in June of 2015, when I was 15, and in May of 2016. Now, let me give you some background information. I live in a pretty shady town, which has plenty of sexual predators and trashy people. I'll call the town PBP. PBP is a weird town. 
You get in there and it's like you're on a new planet. You feel very off, like something is wrong. It's not something you feel immediately, but after like half a year of living there, you begin to realize it. So, one day my dad and I were walking down the street to go catch the bus. This random man, who looked like he was in his 50s, was riding a bicycle down the street. We didn't pay any attention to him, as we were caught up in our own conversation about what we had to buy at Walmart. We only paid him any attention when he stopped and got off his bicycle, staring at me. I instantly felt uncomfortable, but tried to smile and be polite. I figured I was just being irrationally scared. He came up to us and said, Sir, I would just like to say that your daughter is the most beautiful woman I have ever seen in my whole entire life. I would like to marry her. I instantly froze and my smile faltered. I couldn't believe he had just said that. Then my dad shifted so that he could be in front of me and said, She's 15. The man gave a creepy smile, which showed off his nasty yellow teeth. Well then, come and find me when you're 18, sweetheart. After that he rode off. I was a bit scared but figured I wouldn't see him again. After all, I don't leave the house very often. We got onto the bus and I forgot about the whole thing after about 10 minutes. My dad and I did our shopping, came home, and put all of our stuff away. When we were done we decided to sit on the porch outside because we were hot and the house didn't have air conditioning. We were only out there for about five minutes and the same man from earlier came riding by on his bicycle. He glanced over at me but kept riding. My dad went inside to go get a cup of coffee and this guy came riding by again. He did it a couple more times, each time looking at me, until I finally decided to tell my dad and go inside. Even when I was sitting on my couch inside, peeking out the window, I saw him go by two more times. I didn't leave the house for a straight week after that. I had heard so many stories about girls being assaulted, kidnapped, and even murdered. That became one of my biggest fears, and still is. After that week, I decided that I needed some air. I went for a walk down to the Family Dollar, which is about a 15-minute walk. On the way there, I wasn't confronted by anyone. I got an occasional hello, how are you from some people sitting on their porches, but that was about it. On the way back, I felt calmer. I figured the creepy man had forgotten about me. I was listening to music and zoning out, barely aware of my surroundings, when the same guy from earlier came around the corner on his bike and stopped in front of me. I don't think he had been following me, I think he had just been riding around, because when he saw me he looked at me briefly and looked shocked. Then he gave me that same nasty smile, blocked my way, and said, Hello sweetheart. Haven't seen you in a week. I tried to smile, but I felt my heart drop. I shrugged and told him that I was just feeling a little sick and needed some time to rest. He was still smiling and got a little closer to me. I was very close to kicking him in his shins and running to the hair salon behind me. I'm never giving up, you know. He said, before looking me up and down and riding off. I breathed in and ran to my house. For the next couple of weeks, I would only leave the house if my sister had to go somewhere, was driving, or if my dad was walking with me. When he saw I was with someone he wouldn't say anything, just smile. When I quickly ran into stores, he would cycle around them for a couple of minutes and just wait for me until someone came out with me. For the next 10 months when I saw him, I would try and duck somewhere and avoid him or I'd run into a store. The barbershop owner and a lot of his customers know me because I was constantly running in there and asking him if I could hide for a couple of minutes. They have a habit of watching out for me and having someone walk up to the store with me when they see me go by. I think the only reason that man stopped bothering me was because the last time I saw him, he grabbed my arm so hard it left bruises, got in my face, and said, I see you avoiding me. Why are you avoiding me, sweetheart? All I want is you. His eyes were wild and saliva was practically pouring from his mouth. He smelled horrible. I screamed so loud that I swear people from China could hear me. I was in front of the barbershop that day, thank God, and the owner came running out with scissors. They came after him and he ended up speeding away on his bike. I still see him walking around, but when he sees me he avoids me. 
I think he had a drug problem, and the last time he confronted me he was on something really bad. But not once during that entire ordeal did I inform the cops. I guess I was just too determined to think that he'd leave me alone on his own time after he got bored. Creepy bike guy, let's not meet again. My husband died by suicide in June. This put me in a tailspin, which I am only kind of recovering from. To give some context, I have faced depression and suicidal ideation before he passed and have been on medication for it for about three years. He knew how to calm anxiety attacks and he was part of my emergency plan. For about two weeks after he passed, I knew he was there. I would talk to him like I did in life and it helped me carry on. I guess I should say that I felt he was there, but either way these out loud conversations helped. Then, after a while, in mid-July maybe, he wasn't there anymore. This hurt. But, you know, it's part of the healing process. Or maybe he had moved on. Either way, I stopped talking out loud because I felt no one was there. But I still do it when I visit his grave. It helps me feel better. The grave is still unmarked, which bothers me, but I try to leave fresh flowers and scatter the petals of the dead ones I left on the prior visit. It's something. He is buried in a very small cemetery. Cornfields to the east and north. The lawn is not maintained, which I love because it's not artificial. He is in nature. Or as close to nature as one can be with the cemetery requirements. I was visiting him, just talking, late last month or early this month. I told him that things weren't going well. I wanted to die. And work was stressing me out. I stood there in silence for a moment or two. I didn't want to leave him on a bad note when I felt it. The air, it just stopped. It was like I was in my own atmosphere. A bubble. Nebraska is always windy, and I couldn't hear the corn rustle. I couldn't hear the wind chimes we have marking his grave. My breath caught in the sense that I forgot to breathe because of something amazing, not fear or panic, but something like awe. Then I got goose flesh and started to tear up. It was him. He was there, with me, in my silence. I rambled out a teary, oh. Hi. Okay. You're here. Oh. There's no way to explain this, but I knew he was sorry for making me cry, so I reassured him that it was only because he snuck up on me. Then my emotion swung the other way and I started to laugh. That happy cry laugh that people do. I told him I was sorry for waking him up because it must have taken a lot to come be with me and that I wasn't mad, just that I missed him. And no, no he just snuck up on me, it's okay. And no I wasn't going to end it all, I was just really down. But he was here and I was okay. I would be okay. I heard the corn rustling again and he was, I don't know, fading. So I told him to go back to sleep, that I loved him and was so happy to feel him again, but he needed to go back to sleep. I left the cemetery on a high note, still chuckling like an idiot. I was very skeptical of ghosts and spirits before this, and still am for the most part, but that moment in the cemetery was different. He hasn't done it since, and I'm not going to push it because I do think it wore him out. It was just so nice. Also, I don't believe in the religious ideas of heaven or hell, but more the idea of peace and rest. My wife and I moved into our old house in New England about the summer of 2000. We had looked at dozens of houses, but this one just immediately felt like home. Soon after, we invited our good friend James and his husband up for a weekend. Keep James and his husband in mind. We were pretty well into getting our late night party on, playing cards, drinking, and smoking in the dining room. Out of the corner of my eye I saw, though the experience was more like perceived, a very vividly older woman with jet black hair sitting next to the old upright piano in the corner. The piano came with the house and we specifically requested that the previous owner include it in the sale because it was so cool and we didn't have much furniture. It wasn't even slightly scary. In fact, it was just like she was hanging out. I mentioned it to everyone and we laughed it off. Drinking and fun continued through the night. 
I was never really a ghost believer and still a skeptic 100%. But the rest of this story makes me really wonder. Several weeks later, we met a neighbor from down the street who lived in the neighborhood for 45 years. She asked, you live in the Muriel King house. She tells us, Muriel was a really interesting lady. She was a famous fashion designer in the 1930s, and she lived in that house alone after her husband committed suicide. Very tragic, but she was an interesting lady. Very independent and ahead of her time. She traveled all over the world. She was Greek, I think. Greek? I ask. Weird question, but did she have black hair? Yes. She had jet black hair even when she was an old woman. It was very striking. Yep. I got the chills right then. Many weeks later, I met another neighbor from down the street that had lived there for 60 or more years, and he started telling me about Muriel. He said, she was a famous fashion designer. She designed gowns for Rita Hayworth and all the classic film stars. And she designed costumes for Broadway plays too. He continued, her parties were legendary, he tells me. She used to have all her gay boyfriends from Broadway come up on the train and they'd drink and sing show tunes at the piano in the dining room all night long. Yep. Now this all could be coincidental, but it just seems too much so. But she must have been an awesome woman. People from around town have given us some of her original drawings and even an unfinished dress she was working on. There haven't been any more Muriel sightings, but shortly after my wife got pregnant, we both woke up out of a cold sleep at the same time and looked at each other like what the hell? Then our bedroom door slammed hard. We like to think that Muriel wasn't a fan of kids. She never had any of her own. So maybe she was like, later, y'all, I'm out of here. That's my story. When I was young, my father and I often went hunting together. My father was a real outdoorsman. He was tall and kind of a big guy. He taught me almost everything I know about survival in the wild. I remember one time he told me in a slightly exaggerated way how he almost starved to death and survived among wolves and bears. Thanks to my father, I know the diet of almost all animals in the wild, and I remember it even now. For many years, my father was the man who was not afraid of anything. But this changed after an incident. That year we were camping at the foot of a rocky slope in our favorite hunting area. The previous year I had shot a deer for the first time in my life. I was very excited for the next day. Our plan was to get up before sunrise and head out to the meadows a few kilometers to the west. The deer population in this area was quite good. That night my father was again telling me one of his hunting stories from before I was born. In the middle of the story, we heard a high-pitched scream, and I think my father realized that I was a little scared. So he smiled and told me that the sound belonged to a deer. Seeing my father's relaxed demeanor, I relaxed too. After that, we heard that sound a few more times at different intervals, and after a while it got farther and farther away from us. That night the sky was clear and the air was a little cool. My father said that tomorrow would be a beautiful and tiring day and that we should go to sleep. Every time he was in a good mood, my father would sing a folk song, and I would fall asleep to his voice. I was in a deep sleep. I remember waking up with my father shaking me by the shoulders. Son, come on, wake up. We have to go. Come on, get up. The tent was dark. My father was already dressed and ready. I fell asleep. Is the sun up yet? I asked my father. My father shook his head negatively and said, No, son. Hurry up. You have to get up now. That's when I heard screams coming from the rock above us, like wailing. The screams were so loud that they seemed to pierce the darkness of the night. At five-second intervals, the same sound was repeated. The hairs on my arms and the back of my neck started to stand on end. I asked, Dad, what is it, a fox? He said nervously, No. We have to go now. Quickly. I hurriedly started to pack. The screams from the rocks above us never stopped. I had just woken up from sleep. 
My eyes weren't even fully open. My father was acting strangely, and his tone of voice was starting to scare me. He put his bag on the floor of the tent and turned to me and said, Son, I have never heard such a sound in my life. At first, the mysterious sound gave the impression that it belonged to an animal screaming for help, but then it became increasingly strange. I thought to myself that maybe it was someone in need of help. My father said, Pack your things. Take your gun with you. He was a very meticulous man about gun safety. He would never let me enter the tent with a loaded gun. But now when he told me to load the gun inside the tent, I started to get scared. When we came out, the screaming suddenly stopped. It was as if the owner of the voice had noticed us. I looked up quickly. There was no light at the top of the rock. The rock above U.S. was about 25 meters high and too sharp to stand on. We quickly packed up the tent and in a few minutes we were all packed up and ready to set off. The scream started again, but this time they were different. It was like a low hum. It was like the sound of an ambulance siren at the beginning. We started to descend, the sound following behind us. My father had his pistol holstered and his rifle in his hand. Suddenly my father started firing into the air. He fired two shots. After the echo of the gun stopped, we waited quietly for a while. There was no sound. We kept going down. After walking for about half an hour, we came out of the forest and reached a meadow. The screams returned. This time at the edge of the forest. My father signaled me to stop. We were holding our breath. That's not a deer, son, he said. My father started walking so fast I could hardly keep up with him. Now we were in a field, stopping every now and then to listen to the sounds. The screams were definitely following us. After a while, we came to a path in another wooded area. We crossed a bridge over a stream and reached a parking lot. Our car was the only car around. We had parked the car a little away from where we were at the time. My father turned to me and said, I won't stop until I reach the car. Stay close to me. We started running. The weight of the materials on my back made it difficult for me to keep up with my father. The screams behind us started to get closer. It was pitch black. All I could see was the light of the lantern in my father's hand. I was running in fear, each scream echoing behind me making the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. Before we reached the parking lot, my father suddenly stopped. There had been no screaming for about two minutes. My father turned to me and said, You ran ahead of me to the car. I started running without looking back. Dad was following me. I could hear his footsteps. Just then I heard screams very close by. This one lasted longer than usual. Almost ten seconds. Son, run, my father yelled. I can't remember much until we reached the car. I was running so fast that I had to keep my eyes focused on the road to avoid falling. I could feel my father's breath on the back of my neck. That's when I started to cry. The screaming sound was even worse than before. It was as if whatever was making the sound was desperately trying to reach us. The faster we ran, the closer it seemed to us. I could hear the sound of cars passing by on the highway in the distance. I saw our car up ahead, and my father was running to open the door. My father had started the car before I could reach it. I threw myself in so fast that I hit my knee on the door. We both looked at the edge of the woods as we took a sharp turn out of there. We couldn't see what was there, but I could still hear her screams, her voice, despite the sound of the car. I'll never forget the last thing I heard. It was almost like a laugh, a crazy laugh. As we drove further away, my normal perception and emotions returned and I realized that I was crying. My father had turned white. We stopped at a gas station a few kilometers away. I was hugging my father and crying. When my father and I returned home, we didn't tell my mother or my sister what had happened. It remained a secret between us. I tried to talk to him about it several times, but he always dropped the subject. Almost 20 years have passed since that night. Since then, my father and I have never gone hunting, and we probably never will.
When I was a freshman in high school, I met Alex. Now, ten years later, I couldn't tell you why I was so drawn to him, or why I got so attached. He was homely, odd, and quite frequently smelled bad. There was a darker undercurrent that ran below his surface, and I thought I saw unspoken sadness that matched mine, and maybe as a naive 15-year-old, I had the stereotypical we-can-save-each-other-from-our-pain bullcrap fantasy. He wasn't the only boy giving me attention. In fact, he barely even gave me that, since he played me hot and cold emphasis on the cold, but he was the one I wanted. Every time I would start to pull away and give up because he was clearly uninterested, he would pop up, calling me cute and making comments about how seeing me brightens his day. Then he would be back to pursuing someone else. I was 15, naive, and hurt, but still finally had enough. So I decided I was done. He caught wind of this and ended up asking me to be his girlfriend later that same day. I was caught off guard but thought yes finally, he must have just needed time to make a move. He and I dated for two years, and he was a hurricane the entire time. One example, his phone would be off for days at a time, he rarely went to school, and I just wouldn't hear from him. I would finally call his mom because I was worried about not hearing from him at all for three, four, five days, and she would tell me that she hadn't seen him either. When he finally turned his phone back on, he would spit venom at me and call me a crazy cunt because I spammed his phone. I would be in tears and trying to explain I was worried because I hadn't heard from him in days and neither had his mother. Then he would call me a few other names, hang up on me, and turn his phone off. The abuse came in many ways, but disappearing, cussing me out, and calling me names when I voiced how uncomfortable it made me. That was his favorite. I kept trying to break up with him, but whenever I did that, suddenly he was calling me crying and saying I was the love of his life and he was going to kill himself if I left him. After two years, I finally had enough and I ended it for good. I told him I was done. I ignored his threats of suicide. He kept begging. School was out for the summer so he couldn't find me there, which meant he kept showing up at my house. Afternoon, evening, middle of the night. It didn't matter. He would toss bits of bark at my bedroom window. He would sit out there for a long time trying to get me to talk to him. I didn't know what to do. I thought he would give up and that it would be okay soon. One day I was walking home from work, I was a block away from my house, and Alex came sidling up next to me in his car, pleading with me to talk to him. I told him I had nothing more to say. He said, then let me talk, please, he begged. He was crying. I had no intention of getting back together with him, but I still hated seeing him hurt. I agreed to let him say what he wanted so he could get closure. I sat in the car and told him to talk. He started babbling incoherently and kept trying to make me feel bad for abandoning him. I told him the conversation was over and I was leaving. He locked the doors and as I went to manually push the lock on my door up, he grabbed my arm and told me I wasn't leaving. I panicked. I smacked him, shoved him away from me, and scrambled out of the car. I ran the rest of the block home. He continued to lurk. Spammed my inbox drove by my house and place of employment. I ended up rebounding and started dating someone new. He was Alex's complete opposite and made me feel happy and light. However, once Alex caught news of this, he flipped out. He went ballistic. The calls and texts increased both in frequency and in level of mania. He started hanging out right outside of the store I worked at. It was a small store in the mall, so I could see him, just standing there staring at me. Management had to call mall security a few times, but he always came back. Eventually, his texts got threatening. He started saying things about how he hoped my new boyfriend was prepared, and he said that he was willing to go to jail to have me. My mom panicked and believed that I was on the verge of being kidnapped or assaulted. We had gone to the cops a couple times, but they said they couldn't do anything because he technically hadn't broken any laws. We took the threatening messages to them and they said they would start to file a restraining order. They warned him that he couldn't go near me, talk to me, or he was in violation of the order of protection. He kept showing up anyway. One night, around midnight, the doorbell rang. 
My mom was confused and asked if I was expecting anyone. I told her no. She opened the door and there, on the front step, was a card, a rose, and a burning candle. We glanced up and down the street and didn't see anyone. We were immediately spooked because there wasn't enough time for him to ring the doorbell and get out of sight already. You could see a long way down both sides of the street unless he was hiding in the trees along the house. This went on for a while. He kept following me and showing up at my work, which means he kept getting visited by the cops, and his friends even got involved and started threatening me for what I was doing to him. Eventually, the order of protection was placed, and all at once everything stopped. But my paranoia and fear and jumpiness lasted for a long time after that. This story goes back to a few years ago when I was a 17-year-old high school student. Every day I'd walk the 25 or 30 minute journey to and from school. There was a shortcut I could take home that took some time off of the walk and, as a nature lover, the shortcut was very enjoyable. Whenever I'd walk home alone, I would take this shortcut to enjoy the small amount of forest we have in the medium-sized, moderately busy city I live in. My shortcut was pretty well traveled. I would occasionally see other people walking from their neighborhood towards the busy streets close by, or other students walking home from my high school or the college. Sometimes, there would be no one but me on the path. To give you an idea, the path definitely was not groomed, but it was traveled enough you could make out a path from being trampled over the years. The shortcut started off from the busy road by my high school, went into a low-lying open wooded area, with some small ponds. After a few minutes of this, I could veer right up the big hill towards the street parallel to my street. One day, I was walking home from school after staying a bit late for extra help. A few minutes into my shortcut, I noticed a guy standing off the main path a bit, seemingly minding his own business and talking on a cell phone. There was an open backpack sitting on the ground by his feet. Growing up with overprotective parents and in martial arts, I have always been a very cautious person and taken a lot of details, especially being a young girl out walking alone. This wasn't unusual by any means since the entire low-lying area is traveled and there are numerous paths off the main path leading different directions since it isn't a thick forest, sort of like a free-for-all for walking. Sometimes people would stand off the busy road while waiting for the bus stop close by, not wanting to stand in all the traffic fumes while people sped by during rush hour. The only thing I took caution of was that I had been seeing him there a few times that week and had never seen him before. But oh well, maybe he was a college student or just moved into the area. This time walking on the shortcut felt different though, possibly because there was no one else on the path today. But, I started to get this bad feeling in my stomach, the one everyone has a hard time describing but most people know too well. Something was not right. I was already well along my shortcut though and I decided to blame my feelings on me being paranoid, which is not uncommon of me. I kept an eye on him out of my peripheral vision walking by and he continued to talk on his cell phone and didn't seem suspicious. So I continued on my merry way. I must have walked 20 or 25 meters away when the guy stopped talking on the phone and I felt an even bigger feeling of dread in my gut. I turned around to see him crouched over, phone gone, fidgeting around with some sort of cloth and a brown glass bottle. Before I had a second to register what the fuck he was doing, his head shoots up in my direction and the look in his eyes is a terrifying mix between I've been caught and I'm not stopping now. He drops everything, leaving his stuff behind, and starts sprinting straight for me with a cloth in hand. At this point, I'm too far away from the busy road for anyone to see me in the low-lying woodland with this crazy basitard, and I'm too far away to scream bloody murder. My first instinct in that split-second decision is to run towards my neighborhood. I decided this all as I turned around, throwing my heavy backpack on the ground, and sprinting as fast as I could, starting up the hill towards my neighborhood. Judging by appearance, this guy looked like he could break me in two with no effort and I trusted my flight response more than my fight response. Plus I didn't know what the hell he had in his hand. All throughout school I had been the top cross country and track runner in my entire school out of the female and male teams. My running had been my savior on a few other let's not meet worthy occasions, but soon into the chase I knew it wouldn't be enough this time. 
This guy was freaking fast as hell and I could tell he was slowly gaining on me without even looking back. I finally see some fences and backyards up ahead and hoping people are home from work. I start trying to scream help as much as I could with my out of breath and useless voice. I made a split decision to start jumping fences of people's yards, hoping this guy's hurdling skills are worse than his running. The first fence throws him off, but by the second into the next yard he is on my ass and I feel him come insanely close to grabbing my leg. I am crapping myself at this point. I see no cars and driveways, no sign of anyone home, and the only thing that is keeping me from panicking is thinking that I may not ever see my family or friends again. The next yard belongs to people I know rather well, including their dog. Necessary background interruption, this house was close to my street on the street parallel to mine, and I have come to know their dog rather well since they recently moved in. My friend hated the shortcut and sometimes I would walk to school with her on the street down the hill to the busy street. This dog was huge and an absolute maniac and, usually, when kids were walking to school they would put him in the backyard instead of their front yard since he would growl and scare the crap out of the kids walking by while he was tied outside. I love animals so every time we'd walk by I'd talk calmly to him through his menacing, I'll F you up barks. Every time he'd be slightly less vicious to me, until one day the nice people who lived there gave me a treat to give him and, after that, the dog was a nice stop on the way to school. The dog's name is Leo. With that next yard and my newly acquired friend in sight, I had never felt hope like I did in that moment. By some insane stroke of luck, they let him out in their backyard for the afternoon while they were at work. When Leo saw me frantically running toward him, he started wagging his tail, then looked to the guy chasing close behind me, and he started growling. I thought this would be enough to get the guy to F off, but no. He started to jump over the fence the second after I did, but the dog jumped up and his teeth came so close to his face that the creep fell backwards into the other yard straight on his butt as I fell into the dog's yard on my butt. The creep and I stared at each other out of breath for a few seconds, while the dog was barking and jumping like mad at the fence at him. Maybe he was assessing if he could take on Leo or not. I prayed the creep didn't have a knife or something. The guy looked angrier than I've ever seen a person, and after a few seconds got up and started running back down the hill from where we came. I sat there for a few seconds in complete shock and couldn't move until my hero started licking my face. I snapped out of it and ran to the back door and started pounding. They obviously weren't home, or else they probably would have heard what just went down. My house was close, so I jumped the fence and ran the rest of the way home, and called the cops to investigate and try to find the guy. I gave them the best description I could after coming practically face to face with him. The dude's bag was gone, and so was every trace of him. They found my poor backpack in a muddy puddle and the police told me they'd keep looking. Never saw the guy again, I also didn't hear anything more about it, and after calling the office a few times I gave up. They told me during that time they had received sketchy reports of people being stalked, chased, etc. But nothing like mine. Over the last few months there were a few missing person cases. But in a city like the one I'm from, not the worst, but not the best, you can never connect anything like that for sure. The more I thought about it over the years, the more messed up it is, and the more confused I am. First, if he was trying to kidnap me, why didn't he think of a better way to grab and snatch me into the forest before I had the chance to get away or before another trailgoer possibly walked by? He didn't appear to have a weapon on him or anything except that creepy cloth. And what the hell did he have in his hand? A friend thought it may have been chloroform. But I did research on it. Apparently it's more a myth that pouring it on a rag and covering a person's face causes them to faint very quickly. Plus, where the hell would you get it anyway? Thanks to that creeper, I never walked the shortcut anymore without, at least, two friends. And pepper spray or some sort of protection. So kidnapper, amateur stalker, serial killer, or whatever the hell you are, let's never ever meet again. Leo got lots of extra love whenever I saw him. I am usually really safe when it comes to accepting friend requests when it comes to Facebook. Let's just say I made a huge mistake. One day I got home from school logged onto Facebook and saw a friend request. 
It was from a kid who was widely known at my school, he is mentally unstable, and he also had at least 100 mutual friends as me so I accepted. He starts talking to me instantly. It was a pretty normal conversation, like, hey, what's up, same, etc. This guy is also very large, around 300 to 400 pounds, 6 feet tall, and is also 7 years older than me. I was 14 and 5 foot 3 inches when this happened. He started to talk to me every day, having normal conversations. After a while I would stop answering back because I'd be busy or something, and he would get pretty mad. As I didn't want to be rude, I try to be as nice as I can and answer back. He then says, you go to the school, right? I didn't want to answer because even though he goes there also, I just didn't feel right. He messages me again saying, I know you do. I've seen you. I see you every day, man. You're pretty. I stopped talking to him from then on, but he'd still message me despite the fact that I wouldn't answer. I would see him more and more in the halls. It got to the point where he'd be sitting there waiting for me to get off the bus and stare me down. I tried to ignore it the best I could. I'd see him in the halls and he'd just stare at me. I deleted him off Facebook when I got home from school, but he would still manage to send me chat messages. It became so persistent that I just ignored it. One day I was staying at the school a little late to hang out with my friends and one of my friends was talking about some guy who apparently threatened to shoot up the school. I asked him why the school didn't do anything about it, like the usual evacuation. And he said that the kid was mentally unstable, there was no reason to because they thought he'd calm down and not go through with it. I started to panic. I asked him who it was. Well, sure enough it was the same person that had been creeping on me. I told them what was happening, they started freaking out too, and told me to check my messages when I got home. When I got home I read all the messages he sent me. It started out like this, you are so pretty, why are you so pretty, where were you today, to will you go to prom with me? I bought you a ticket, please go with me, will you go out with me? Then finally it turned to this, fine don't answer me you whore, I'm going to rip your head off, and got more and more violent. He also posts on my wall saying extremely inappropriate things, talking about sex and killing people. I did not go to school the next day. I told my mom all about it and she had me print it out and go to the school with it. My mom drove me to school and we went straight to my guidance counselor. When she read what he was saying to me she even started to freak out. She tried her best to make it so he couldn't be in the same hallway as me. This worked out for about three months. The last week of school it started up again. I got off the bus and he'd be sitting there waiting for me. He then followed me into school and followed me around the school. He even waited outside my classroom for me to finish my exam. I asked one of my friends if he could watch out for me because the guy was following me again. Last day of school finally happened and I didn't have to deal with him for about two months. When school started back up again, after a couple panic attacks, I found out he was arrested and is now going to a school for very troubled kids.